Okay, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Destiny Coleman. I am the Administrative Director of the Wultamade Center at Ohio Wesleyan University. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Sagan National Colloquium and Annual Heisler Business Ethics Lecture, sponsored by the Wultamade Center for Economics, Business, and Entrepreneurship. The Wultamade Center helps students to integrate business theory and practice and provides lectures and other resources to benefit students, faculty, and the local community. Tonight's lecture is funded by the Heisler Family Endowment for the Study of Ethics. The endowment honors OWU graduates, James Heisler, class of 1938, Robert Heisler, class of 1942, and Bruce Heisler, class of 1949. The Heislers were born in Ravenna, Ohio, and were the founders of the A.C. Williams Company. During World War II, they worked with the Canadian government, manufacturing lightweight material for aircraft. Tonight, we have the honor of providing this opportunity because the Heislers believed in business ethics and ran their company with the highest moral standards. It is because of their legacy that the Wultamade Center can create and share these programs. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Rock Jones, president of Ohio Wesleyan University. Thank you, Destiny, and good evening, everyone. Let me begin by welcoming Destiny, who is still relatively new as the administrative director of the Wultamade Center. We are thrilled to have you at Ohio Wesleyan, and I appreciate you opening us this evening. It's a pleasure to add my welcome to all of you to the lecture this evening. Tonight, we gather at the intersection of two important educational traditions at Ohio Wesleyan. The Sagan National Colloquium, first established in 1984, annually explores an issue of national and international significance. The colloquium is intentionally interdisciplinary, offering our students in the larger community the opportunity to explore a topic of contemporary relevance from multiple perspectives. In the process, the colloquium forges links between liberal arts learning and the lifelong civic art of informed, involved citizenship. As we celebrate 100 years of business classes at OWU, this Sagan National Colloquium this year explores how the liberal arts continues uh, to contributes to the best business ideas and how business can empower students working across the disciplines to pursue what they love and create positive social change. Ohio Wesleyan's annual Heisler Business Ethics Lecture Series, as you have just heard, is sponsored by the University's Voltamati Center for Economics, Business, and Entrepreneurship and funded by the Heisler Family Endowment for the Study of Ethics. The endowment honors three members of the Heisler family, as you have heard. Each of these men became leaders in their business, and each was recognized for grounding their leadership in ethical principles. In 1999, the National Colloquium was endowed by 1948 OWU alumni, John and Marge Sagan, classmates of Bruce Heisler. Throughout their lives, the Sagans tirelessly dedicated their expertise and energy to their alma mater, significantly benefiting the university and its students. John Sagan was the longtime treasurer of Ford Motor Company and a superb exemplar of the kind of ethical leadership that grows out of a liberal arts education and takes root in American industry. Tonight, the Sagan National Colloquium presents the Heisler Lecture, giving us the opportunity to remember noteworthy Ohio Wesleyan alumni who understood that successful leadership that stands the test of time is built on the foundation of ethical principles with a moral compass. Tonight, we welcome Jim Stern, who has spent more than 35 years selling and marketing technical products. He began his career helping people understand Vivicalc, the first spreadsheet computer software, at a time when a personal computer was an oxymoron. He sold business computers to companies that had never owned one in the 1980s, consulted and keynoted about online marketing in the 1990s, and founded a conference and a professional association around digital analytics in the 2000s. 
is another of the exemplar, the legacy that we attach to the names Sagan and Heisler. Jim Stern has spent his career as a pioneer looking beyond the horizon to understand what is coming next. Stern is currently focused on the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning to marketing, which is the subject of his most recent book, Artificial Intelligence for Marketing, Practical Applications. I can think of no challenge more vexing for those who seek to integrate ethics and leadership in our time than the application of artificial intelligence. AI offers enormous possibility for advancing the business of organizations in every sector and advancing the quality of life of the human population and the planet we call home. It also carries great risk if carried used in ways that ultimately threaten our values and damage the spirit. It is an ideal topic for the Heisler Lecture in Business Ethics in a Sagan National Colloquium. Please join me in welcoming Jim Stern. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much. It is, um, it, it was an honor to be asked. And after that introduction to the organization and the series, I'm now completely intimidated. Um, this, is, this is a remarkable organization and a great series. And the people who founded it 22 years ago probably never would have guessed that somebody would be coming on to talk about artificial intelligence. So time, time moves on quickly. Um, I want to cover three broad areas to set the frame in order to, to tee up questions and have conversation. Um, I want to talk about what is artificial intelligence for those of you who heard about it and read about it. Those of you who are data scientists, forgive me for the gross oversimplification, but that's what it takes for the rest of us to understand. I then want to talk about how it works, how it's broken into three large areas. And for the purposes of conversation, it's important to understand the three different areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then finally, ethically, what, what do we need to look out for? So let me dive in with this definition of AI. It is an umbrella term that is most commonly misused in science fiction. So there's general artificial intelligence, which is the idea of sentience and the ability for computers to wake up and talk to each other and form the robot apocalypse. And that is science fiction. Science fact is not general AI, but narrow AI or functional AI, which solves very specific problems in a pretty amazing way. Within artificial intelligence, we've got three main areas, natural language processing, computer vision, and machine learning. Natural language processing is speech to text, text to meaning, the ability for the computer to talk back to you if you have a smart speaker or one of those devices I will not mention by name because you probably have one in the room and I don't want it to turn off your refrigerator by mistake. Um, Natural language processing has come a long way, uh, not just from the beginning, but uh, recently. I mean, it's, it's made leaps and bounds and is astonishingly capable of, of hearing, understanding, interpreting, and assigning sentiment to what we say and how we talk and what we write. Computer vision is the ability to recognize things. Um, and in even in video, even in real live video, so that you, you can have a self-driving car. And the ability to look at a picture and say, that's a cat and that's a dog is pretty impressive. But the ability to drive down the street at 30 miles an hour and say, that's a pedestrian and that's a bicyclist and that's a tree and that's a mailbox, that's remarkable. And we've, again, come a long way. But machine learning is the thing that we're applying to all of the above. And it's, it's the fascinating area of, of how we taught computers how to compute differently. We start with straight programming. And for me, that was Fortran and COBOL. And so, you know, C++, JavaScript, HTML. Um, these are instruction sets you give to the computer and they, the computer executes it specifically. 
And if it has a problem, it spits out an error message or blue screen of death, and then you're in trouble. We then got more sophisticated and we made software that allowed you to manipulate the symbols. So I can create a set of variables, assign them values, figure out formulas between the variables and play lots of what if games. And if you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about an Excel spreadsheet. It is a, a different level of software. It is a program that does that allows you to manipulate things. Photoshop allows you to manipulate images. And that's a, a higher level. The next level is statistical analysis, predictive analysis, where we are building models of the world that can help us predict what can happen. And it's extremely straightforward in concept, but not in execution, that you take one year's worth of data and you take the first nine months and you build a mathematical model that describes that nine months to a T and you run the model to predict the last three months of the year, and then you compare that last three months to reality. And if it, look, and if it predicts what actually happened, you've got a solid model. If not, eh, you need to tweak it. And it's fragile and it's filled with assumptions and the statistician has to really know what they're doing. And then it can be a prediction that is useful for a while. The, the common refrain in statistics is that all models are wrong. Some models are useful. It's, it's like a map. It's not the territory. It's just an impression of the territory. But the sophistication and the ability to predict the future is significant. I almost said statistically significant, but bad pun. Then we move on to machine learning. Machine learning is give the computer the task of looking at data and building the model itself. And when it gets new information, it changes the model and makes new predictions. And this can be a feedback loop that is called learning. That's a new level of programming that we've never had before. It is a unique capability uh, that has caused a lot of these breakthroughs. So there are three big areas of machine learning. There's supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Supervised learning is um, do what I say. And what I say is here are 10,000 pictures of cats. And here's a picture you've never seen before. Tell me, is there a cat in this? And the machine says, yes. And you go, yeah, good. And here's another one. And the machine says, yes. He goes, no, nope, not a cat. And the machine changes the mathematical model of what it thinks a cat should be and learns. And you feed it enough, you supervise it by saying yes and no. And it learns how to recognize a cat really well, really fast, which is incredibly useful for recognizing trees and bicycles and pedestrians. Also cancerous cells, new things, night sky, um, patterns of human behavior that might predict some of the malfeasance. It is, it is remarkable. So supervised learning is do what I say. Unsupervised learning is tell me something I didn't know. Here is a whole bunch of data, structured and unstructured. Structured means it's in rows and columns and it's all perfectly tagged. Unstructured means here's 200,000 tweets. Go figure it out. And we give all of this data to the machine and we say, tell me something I didn't know. Find a correlation. See if there's a relationship between any of these data points. Now there's a lot of things that will bubble up that are not interesting. When it rains, we sell more umbrellas. Yeah, I know. I mean, good machine, well done, pat you on the head, but no, it, it's not helpful. Um, when ice cream sales go up, more people drown. Oh no, ice cream is killing people. No, no, no. It's a correlation. Causation is the temperature. When the temperature goes up, more people go swimming. 
and so more people drown and more people eat ice cream and they're not related except they're correlated. So it's correlative, not causative. The machine is great at finding correlations. Some correlations, so my, my expertise is in marketing. <clears throat> the machine might say, if somebody on Facebook saw this ad and clicked on it, and they had looked at these articles before that, and they'd come back to your website twice, they are five times more likely to buy from you if you offer them a 5% discount. That's useful. If the machine says, it turns out that if we uh, shorten up the stoplight, the stop light signal at a, this intersection by five seconds every cycle, traffic is improved. That's valuable. That's hugely useful. It's a correlation. So first of all is do what I say, supervised. Unsupervised, tell me something I didn't know. The third one is figure out how to make this happen. And that's called reinforcement learning. So for example, um, well, before the example, the machine needs a data. A, I mean, it all has a lot of data, a huge amount of data. And it's one of the reasons artificial intelligence hasn't been very successful so far because we didn't have enough data. Now we needs a lot of data. It needs a specific goal to achieve. And then it needs control over the environment so that it can have agency. It can take an action. So give it lots of data. And the goal is self-driving. Goal is stay in your lane on the highway. And the information is the white lines and the cars on either side of you. And it has control over the car. And if it gets some outside the line, you, you adjust for it and you've taught it something. The marketing example is I want to create an email that goes out that more people will open. And here are a bunch of headlines. In fact, here are a bunch of words to play with. Use whatever words you want in whatever way in the subject line of that email, send it out to these people and figure out which headline gets the best open rate. And the machine learns that um, free, special offer, discount, those are great words. But if we're not careful, it might also learn that the best subject line ever to get people to open it up is, we have your children open this email if you ever want to see them again. Not what we're trying to accomplish. So we have to be very careful what the goal is. So do what I say, supervised. Tell me something I didn't know, unsupervised. Make this thing happen with reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning works because you give the machine a numerical reward for accomplishing something. So you put a robot in the middle of the room and you say, go out the door. And you don't tell it where the door is or, or how far away the door is, not even necessarily what a door is, but to explain what out is. It's these four walls, we want you to go beyond these four walls without running into anything. Go out the door. And it goes up to a wall and hits something. And oh, no, that didn't work. And it hits something else. Oh, that didn't work. And eventually it finds the door and goes through and it gets a numerical reward. So now it knows how to leave the room. And it might apply that to leaving other rooms. So it learns by doing. You put all these together and you can see that they're incredibly powerful for a wide variety of, of activities and functions. They're not good for sentience, but they're good at very specific, very narrow things that you wanted to accomplish. Now, the, the running joke in data science is if you give the machine control over the paperclip factory and your goal is to optimize the manufacture of paperclips, the machine will optimize shop floor control and supply chain management and human resource planning. And then it will think, you know, I need another factory. So it'll build another factory. And then it realizes it needs more money to build more factories. So it figures out how to manipulate the stock market. And then it invests in Bitcoin. 
And eventually it studies hypothetical physics and learns how to turn every molecule on planet Earth into a paperclip. You didn't give it the right goal. So we have to be very careful that we give it the right data, that we have the right problem to solve, the right goal, and that we're, we have somebody who's monitoring the output to say, yes, that, yes, that is a cat, or no, it's not a cat, or yeah, people would open that email, but it's a bad idea. Or yes, that's a correlation, but it's not useful. Thank you very much. So there's artificial intelligence writ large, big broad brush strokes. It is a new kind of software. That's kind of it. It is not magic. It is complex and therefore expensive. It requires a problem that's, that's suited to its power and its cost. If you can solve a problem or answer a question with an Excel spreadsheet or a predictive analytics model, by all means do that first. But if you have an intractable, intractable problem with lots of data and valuable output, it, it's not just I'm curious, but we can actually use, valuably use the output from this. Machine learning is astonishingly powerful. Which brings us to the ethics side of things, the third leg of what I wanted to talk about today. You do not have to fear the robot apocalypse, but you do have to be aware that there are three major areas where we're gonna run into trouble. And we is anybody who uses this stuff and we as a society, unless we're aware and careful and monitor for these things. <clears throat> they are bias in the data, they are bad actors, and they are willful ignorance. Bias in the data is the most difficult one to, to wrap your mind around and to manage for. The clearest example was, was probably four years ago, five years ago now. Amazon was receiving so many resumes that they built a machine learning model that said, go through all these resumes and just, just show us the only the ones of the people who are gonna be most likely to be successful at Amazon. And the computer scientists say, well, great. What data do we have to chew on? Well, here are employee records. They include uh, how long the person has been with the company, how many promotions they've had, how many raises they've had, how many positive reviews from their cohort their, their colleagues and their reports have given them, uh, the size of the project they're working on, success rating of the project, and a bunch of other stuff. Like, here's just a bunch of data. Go, these are the successful people, and go find more people like them. And the man said, great, here are a bunch of resumes from older white men. And it took two seconds for Amazon to look at that and go, yeah, this model does not work. This is not right. This is not what we're trying to test for. The bias is built into the data already on a more mechanical, practical sense. People started creating computer vision systems to do facial recognition. The machine had an incredibly different, difficult time recognizing the faces of women of color because the databases that the scientists had used were primarily of white men. The bias is in the data. So unless you're very careful about the data, you only get more of what you already have. Now, this, this blows all the way out to all of medicine. Uh, Western medicine, as it has been practiced forever, has been, let's run these tests on white males. So if a woman comes into a hospital with a heart condition having had a heart attack, it doesn't look like a male heart attack and it is often misdiagnosed. That is in the data already. So some people say, oh, well, you know, we've got scientific medical data. It's like, mm, no, actually you don't. And this was really brought home when one hospital said, we're going to create a learning system that will aid the emergency room doctors and nurses for doing triage. If somebody comes in with presenting with pneumonia, who do we treat right away? 
And who do we ask to sit quietly and who do we send home? I mean, we, we can't treat everybody. We don't have enough manpower. We don't have enough money. But the, the worst cases we want to take right away. And the machine said, oh, it turns out there's this one group over here. It did a correlation and it discovered that if you come in presenting with pneumonia and you have had a history of asthma, you heal much faster than everybody else. So they should just send those people home. So we had the data and the data was solid. We had the problem to solve, good problem. Third part, smell test. See, the output makes sense. And the doctors and nurses were horrified because it's exactly the wrong, it's exactly opposite. If somebody comes in presenting with pneumonia and they have a history of asthma, they take those people to intensive care immediately. And that's why they heal faster. The machine didn't know that. So the machine doesn't have the context. So it takes a lot of effort to pay attention to bias in the data and provide that smell test to make sure that somebody is monitoring what comes out the other end. Same thing is true in the criminal system. Um, the, they, they, built, they have been building systems to try to help judges determine how much jail time should this person have? Or police, where should we put more patrols? Where should we have more officers on the street? And the data says that the majority of crime happens in a small area inside the city that is predominantly people of low income, which is predominantly people of color. And so the police say, oh, we should have more feet on the street there. So they put more cops into that area and there are more arrests, which causes the numbers to continue to climb, not representing reality. So this bias in the data is a really tough problem to chew on. A more straightforward and much scarier problem is bad actors, which we've seen recently in uh, people trying to um, use artificial intelligence and machine learning and especially reinforcement learning to get around network security and be able to log into places they shouldn't be and change data and change machinery and poison the water supply. And that's scary. And that is um, cyber war. It is going on, it has been going on for a while and it will, it will continue forever because the bad guys are constantly using these fancy new sophisticated tools to figure out a way around network security. And the network security people are using them to figure out how to recognize the bad guys. That's a never ending thing. But you can use machine learning to recognize behavior on Facebook. And you know, if, if you've never heard the word uh, Cambridge Analytica, short story. Cambridge Analytica got a hold of people's profiles and then they found a way, and this is where they completely went illegal, they found a way that if you answered one of those questionnaires, you know, what Disney princess are you? Or how do you feel? Where do you rank on a level of gun control? Not only would it get your answers, but it would find all of your contacts and get all of their data so that they can then send advertising to you and all of your friends without you knowing it. And they used machine learning to determine uh, for gun control was a specific example. Either you were a second amendment, amendment gun toting, I'm for freedom, or you were a nervous Nelly, I need a gun in my house to protect my family. And so they split between those two. And each group got different messaging about why they should not vote for Hillary Clinton. And they spent a huge amount of money on this and she lost. Well, she didn't, but she did. You know what I mean? That's a bad actor using sophisticated tools in a sophisticated way for bad purpose. So that's, that's something we're always gonna deal with. You know, there are, there are bad people in the world. That's morality. Let's talk about ethics. And that's where willful ignorance comes in. There are privacy laws. There are data protection laws that we are supposed to follow. And if you don't, you are a bad actor. But the law is the floor. 
the law is the lowest you can go. Anything below that is illegal. We will put you in jail for doing that. But morality and ethics are above that. And so how ethical is a company who turns a blind eye who, or, or, or actively does not put together an, a committee to figure out policy for monitoring their data, for monitoring their machine learning tools, for monitoring the output, for thinking about what the unintended consequences might be. Those people are willfully ignorant and they're, they're not acting illegally, but they're definitely acting unethically. And that's where corporate culture comes in. The, the people at Facebook make a living on figuring out what ad should go in front of what person. That's how they make money. The people at Google make money by showing you the best result for your search from your perspective. If this search result gets more clicks, it must be the best one. This person is searching the same way that you're searching for. Maybe that will be the right answer for them as well. And yet two weeks ago, they fired two people from their AI ethics committee. Hmm, were those people publishing papers that would make Google look bad? Hmm, is that legal? Of course, is it ethical? Hmm. So whether it is bias in the data, which we can actively address, or it's bad actors, which we must actively defend against, or unethical behavior by corporations that is hard to detect, very difficult to prove. And, and we can only hope that smarter people prevail. There are downsides to a tool this powerful. So, Artificial intelligence is natural language processing, computer vision, machine learning. Machine learning is um, supervised, do what I tell you. Unsupervised, tell me something I didn't know. And reinforcement, here's what I want you to do, go figure out how to do it. The ethics are up for discussion. And that's why I was very excited to, to come and, and talk with everybody here. I want to I want to know what your questions are. So thanks for listening. Jim, thanks so much. This was a, a great introduction to a really complex and important topic. Um, I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions. In the meantime, if you have a question, please go ahead and put that into the chat and we'll answer as many of them as, as we have time for. So at the start of your talk, you uh, you gave us the scenario where uh, we're, we're trying to apply AI to marketing and we're asking it to optimize email subject lines. And the, you gave us the example of the, of the machine optimizing for the subject line related to kidnapping children. And you know that's, that's causing people to open the email. How, how do we prevent that from happening? You know, the, it's, you, know you, you talked about the importance of monitoring and kind of checking on on what the machine is doing but once the thing once it's been released into the wild and it's making decisions really rapidly and everything's just rolling how do we prevent things like that uh three ways first of all uh guidelines guide rails um let's let's give it only certain words and phrases that it's allowed to use um that's part one so we've, we've already we've already started with some rules it's not just running rampant it's not just grabbing the dictionary and putting a word salad together. <clears throat> number two is monitoring the output, is, is keeping an eye on what's going on. And number three is something called an adversarial network that monitors for those kinds of things. So we're building systems. I mean, this is where, where artificial intelligence gets fractal. Um, if I have five different kinds of algorithms, um, I have a neural network and I have a decision tree a uh, random forest to have a support vector machine, a bunch of these algorithms that all could do the job. I can write an AI system that will 
give the data to all of these kinds of tools and see which ones are the most successful. So we've got a, a AI system that can manage AI systems. And one of those can be monitor the output, monitor for things that we're aware of and monitor for things that cause email opens to go down, monitor for things that cause phone calls to the call center to go up. And then we, you know, we've got to decide what we want it to solve for so that you can apply the brakes. And, and you know, in marketing, you, know, you put the wrong message in front of the wrong person at the wrong time, you have lost 1,000th of a penny, oops. But if you put the wrong car in the wrong crosswalk at the wrong time, you kill somebody. So there's different levels of responsibility. Okay, we've, we've received a few questions. I'll start with one from Katie. Katie asks, how will AI technology impact political campaigns and political research? Well, that's the Cambridge Analytica conundrum. It is what Russian interference is all about. It is a significant problem and it's why people love to hate Facebook right now because Facebook has not done enough to protect the public from the bad actors. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's brilliant. On the other hand, it's terrifying. Um, it's brilliant that you can, you can subscribe to a data flow of Facebook data that will give you some insight into whether somebody is likely or unlikely to vote for your candidate. And if they are 65% likely to vote for your candidate, don't spend any money on them. And if they are 65% unlikely to vote for your candidate, don't waste your time. But those swing votes in the middle, ah, those are the people we want to reach. That's great. That's valuable. Now the question is, what messaging do you use? And that's where the danger comes in. OK, we have a question from Alice Simon. She says, has AI changed the questions or the goals or simply given us a different way to ask the same questions or reach the same goals? Brilliant question. Uh, the answer is same goals and new questions because we're able to ask questions that we just weren't able to ask before. Um, in, uh, in marketing, let me say, let's start with lead scoring. Let's say I get a thousand leads a day and I have one intern and the intern looks at it and says, well, this is somebody from a little tiny two person company. They'll never be a customer. I'm not gonna give that to the sales department. Here's the, oh, here's a major corporation and there's three people from the same corporation. This is a hot lead. I'm gonna get this to the salespeople right away. That's using some common sense and some rules. And that's something that machine learning can do because if it passes along a bad lead, the sales rep says, no, that's terrible. And the machine learns not to do that again. And that's terrific. But what happens is when you talk about it at scale, if I get 10,000 leads a day and I have one intern, I, it's not worth hiring a hundred interns. It's not, it's not worth the effort, but it is worth the effort to build a machine to do it. And that is where we can ask new questions. Now, the whole area of new questions is um, not just of scale, it's asking things we haven't thought to ask before. So that's where I'm very excited about the unsupervised. Here's a bunch of data that we never had before. Does it tell us anything? Is there something in this data that's new? Or is there a correlation that is interesting, useful, worth further study? Our next question is, what companies are using AI ethically such that they are role models for other companies? Yeah, the the I'm gonna I'm gonna do a hip check on this one. Uh, you know, wh which company? This goes back to which companies are the best at sales and marketing, and which companies have the best websites, and which companies have the best email campaigns. There aren't any. There 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 is no large organization that does everything uniformly. There are some campaigns that are brilliant. There are some projects that are fantastic. There are some groups and committees and organizations within a company that are being very ethical. There, but there is no, I can't say, oh, IBM for sure. Now, IBM recently stepped up and said, 
here's an area of natural language processing we're not going to pursue anymore because we consider it dangerous and we don't think people should like good for you but that doesn't mean that everything they do is ethical so i'm going to i'm going to cheat on that saying you eh, know there is no company answer to that sorry okay our next question uh in your professional opinion, is there a language or software that you consider to be cutting edge in the realm of data science? This is coming from a student, I think, thinking forward about a career. Um, yeah, the saying goes, um, if it's written in R, it's probably statistical analysis. And if it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning, but you know it's artificial intelligence if it's written in PowerPoint. So um, the, the languages are coming out fast and furious. Um, the advice is to study, is to pick one and go deep. Be aware of all of them, but you cannot learn all of them and, you, and it's a horse race. So learn R really well or learn Python really well, but everybody, and I mean everybody, should learn SQL. Um, it's kind of a, I, you know, my first round was learning basic before I got into Fortran and COBOL. And it was a way to learn what is a computer language. And learning SQL is a way to understand data and statistics. And if you learn SQL, and I don't mean that you have to become an expert at it, but understand it so that you can talk to a data scientist about it you can apply that knowledge to any other language that pops up. Um, those of us in the analytics world are very fervent that I don't want to hire, I, I would love to hire for technology, but there is nobody who's been doing this technology for 20 years. It's not that old. Instead, I'm going to hire for curiosity and critical thinking and enthusiasm. If you walk into my office and say, this is the greatest thing ever. I really want to do this for a living and, and I want to learn more about how to do it. Can I, can I come here and learn how to do this at this company? It's like, you're hired. You are just, I come on board. Yeah, teach the rest of us. Our next question is why vote? Because there are, all, there are already new Cambridge Analyticas out there. No, there aren't. And we're being very careful to monitor them now that we're aware of how bad it is. And um, they are the outlier. And this is, this is part of the problem with Facebook is that Facebook wants to put something in front of you that will keep you around longer. YouTube wants you to click on one more video. So the machine is not conscious of what it's putting in front of you. It's just trying to find the next thing that'll get you to click more. And what it learns over time, again, not consciously, but statistically, is that the more shocking and suspenseful and bizarre and, and, and sensational, the more people will click. And that gets us spun off into conspiracy theories. And you know, you're, you're looking at, at what's the best used car to buy, and an hour later, you're looking at high-speed auto crashes because the machine is just showing you something to get you to look again. That's where we need to worry. But those are the edge cases. And when you have several hundred million people voting, the edge cases don't really count that much. Please vote. <laughs> Please vote. Please vote, everyone. Uh, so next question, this is, this is a broad question. Uh, how reliable is AI and machine learning for everyone? So I, I think we're getting at this, this idea of you know, how much can we depend on this as part of our everyday life? Is this something that's integrated into our world and that, that we, can, we, we can lean on and count on? Yes. Um, um, uh, the, you know, the, same was <laughs> the same was said about computers in the 1980s. You know, I, I imagine it's 1985 and you've never used a computer before, or it's 1995 and you've never seen the internet before, or it's 2005, and you've never seen a smartphone before. And now you can't imagine life without those things. Artificial intelligence is already in your home. It's already in your wristwatch. It's already in your phone. It's, it's, it's just not 
quite visible, which is an indication of how well it's working. But eventually, uh, we're going to depend on it a great deal because we're going to figure out how to do it better. No, I take that back. You guys are going to figure out how to do it better. Uh, okay, so we have a question. What are your thoughts on AI enforcement on social media platforms? For example, AI police who determine if content is fake, malicious, et cetera. Um, this, is, this is part of the ethical problem of creating a system that will reflect our values rather than the law. And our values, um, well, who decides? Whose values? Is it, is it Taiwan Canadian values? Is it Mexican values? Is it California values or Florida values? And, and this, is an un, this is an unanswerable question. So what, what has to happen is companies have to choose how ethical they're going to be and find a way to communicate the value of their ethics and the value as part of their brand. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to ramble. So give me another question. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So this is a question I think a lot of people have on their minds. How do you think AI will impact the future of work? Will most of what we do be augmented with AI and will it replace a majority of jobs? Uh, yes and no. Yes, definitely augmentation. Um, so I have written 12 books and I cannot spell to save life. Spell check, I depend on it. And not only spell check, but then I add words to my dictionary because these are words I always use. The dictionary didn't know about it. I'm in a fast changing technical world where new words come up all the time. And so I'm teaching the machine. Well, that's not AI, that's just rules-based software. But now Google is, you know, when I'm using Gmail, Google is starting to complete my sentences and I hit return and it types out the rest of it. it watches how I write and it gets to know my vernacular and my grammar and and at first it was stupid and terrible. And now it's pretty darn useful and I can write faster. It is, I'm accustomed to it. We are, we are finding new ways to augment ourselves. Um, there is a friend of mine started a company called x.ai, which schedules meetings. So I send you an email saying, hey, let's get together for lunch sometime next week. When's good? And I copy Amy at x.ai. And you and Amy have this conversation because Amy is looking at my calendar and knows what I like and knows how long it takes to get from my office to various restaurants. Says, well, on Thursday and Friday, Jim is available to get there, but not next week. Which of these work for you? You answer Amy. Amy puts it on my calendar. And this all happens without me looking at it. If you're using Amy at x.ai, and I am, and I send you that, Amy just says, here's when your appointment is going to be, because <laughs> she's looking at both of our calendars. It's If I'm trying to schedule a conference room with, in, in a company of a thousand people, and we're all fighting over the conference room, and 10 of us, how do we get 10 people to the same conference room on the same date at the same time? If we're all hooked into x.ai, it just tells us what the date is. It schedules it for us. We will totally depend on that stuff going forward, and it will be absurdly valuable and how will we ever have lived without it? So our next, our next question is directly related to our ethics focus for the night. You referred to laws as the floor with ethics being a higher standard. Is it possible to raise the legal standard to ensure that AI is used ethically? I would say yes in Europe and no in the United States. Um, let me let me wander off philosophically for a second. The European European law is based on essentially do no harm. And in the United States, it's essentially, well, it's not illegal. And so if it's not officially illegal, you can't arrest me for it. And so we're starting to have rules and law. We're we're starting to um so has some privacy laws that were written by business lobbyists 
So yeah, it's it's it says nice things, but it doesn't have any teeth. Um, should we? Yes, we absolutely should. Can we? Um, I'm sorry, that's a philosophical question. I, I do want to jump back to the jobs bit. I, I left off the second half, sure. which is will it replace jobs? No. Um, a a steam shovel can t do the work of a hundred people with hand shovels, but it doesn't get rid of all diggers. Somebody has to run the machine. And the more steam shovels that are created, then the more jobs there are to create and manage and maintain. So a, the, the, the net result will be that there will be more jobs. We just don't know what they are yet. Um, the, you know, the jobs of every 35 year old in the country was unknown and unconceivable 20 years ago. So what's your job gonna be 20 years from now? I don't know. Come back from the future and tell me, please. So you gave us a few examples of how the output from, from AI can have, have bias built into it because there's bias in the data. Is, is AI a useful tool for identifying bias? Yes. And, and that means that's what the adversarial network is for. Um, so one of the examples is um, looking at people's resumes. And we want to pull it, we want to put all the data in, and then we want to pull out anything that is race, gender, sexual orientation. We, we do not want any of those to be part of the decision making. And then it goes through the machine and the machine says, well, these are the best candidates. And at some point, the serial network comes in and says, wait a minute, at this point in decision making, can I deduce gender, race, income level, sexual orientation? And maybe, oh, look, zip code, ah, uh, uh, salary history, oh, that's an, that, from that I can deduce race. And so therefore we have to go back and the machine has to refigure how it's analyzing it in order so that you cannot bias for those things. Very complex to do and something that takes rigorous um, uh, awareness and attention. All right, we're coming up on time. One, one more question. Oh, I'll, I'll let Alex's question preempt mine. Uh, Alex asks, uh, machine, machine learning seems prominent in the music entertainment industry. As a data scientist, what other skills are useful to learn in this type of industry? Um, so what, what skills are important for, for entertainment or what is important for machine learning? I'm, I'm not sure which way we're going. Um, the, there is, in order to make the most of artificial intelligence, you need to know statistics. Like for me, I was a Shakespeare major and a statistics class would have been the last thing I would have wanted to take. And I really wish I had. So I really recommend that you do even though it seems boring and, and dusty and deadly, it actually has value. This is, you know, well, I'm never going to use algebra, but you are going to use statistics. Okay, so do that so you, you understand it and add SQL to that. Um, then you need to understand computer science. How is it collected? How is it stored? How is it manipulated? Again, you don't have to become an IT expert, but you have to understand it well enough that you can talk to IT experts. Then third, you need to have domain knowledge in the industry that you're going into. My domain knowledge is marketing. Somebody else's is pharmaceuticals. Somebody else's rocket science. Somebody else's entertainment. Whatever your interests are, go really deep because the data science will change and the statistics Six can still be applied, but the more you know about your industry and your area of interest, the, the more valuable it will be. And I have come to realize that absolutely everything in the world is fascinating if you study it deep enough and long enough. Anything. How pencils are made. Fascinating. So uh, last question. Uh, ethical problems in business are, are nothing new. We've always had ethical problems that we've had to deal with and schools have long attempted to, to teach 
some way of approaching ethics and reaching the right conclusions. Do you think that with the, the rise of, of AI and machine learning, the ethical tools that we've been using, are they still adequate or do we need to find a way to teach ethics differently? I think the teaching of ethics is orthogonal. We've got, we've got science and data, and then we've got humans. <laughs> they are, they're, they're on a different, they're going in a direction on a different plane. And so that the way that we're teaching ethics still applies. It's philosophy. And that isn't going to make, it's not going to change at all, whether we're in space, underwater, we're dealing with robots, it's philosophy. And it, it, you know, Socrates and Plato knew what they were talking about. All right, Jim, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to hear from you. We really appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions and have a discussion with us. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience who joined tonight. If you jumped in late and you wanna catch the whole talk, the recording will be posted on later, online later along with all of the talks in this Sega National Colloquium series. Uh, thanks everyone, good night. And we hope to see you at the next talk.